Uh, good morning, everyone. First thing I want to start off with is I'd like everyone to, if you have earbuds in, remove them. If you have your cell phones out, please put them away. Uh, we have a lot of people that have put a lot of time into today's program, and we think it's a pretty important message uh, that we want to get to you guys, so we kind of don't want any distractions. That's kind of the theme of the program. Now, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Mr. Geyer. I'm a math teacher at the high school. Before we actually get started into the program, we definitely have to do some thank yous. First thank you is to the high school and the district administration. We've been doing this program for 14 years, and they have remained supportive throughout that time. And they have been supportive of the mission of this program. The mission is to bring you a program that we think will have a positive impact on everyone in this room. We'd also like to thank TNT Youth Ministries, Efforta Community Church, Berlanco Insurance, and the Efforta Area Education Foundation. Without their support, we would not be able to put on this program for you. First part of the program here is Mr. Bischoff, Mr. Rossman, and the video crew put together a video recap of the events of yesterday. So for those of you who missed it and our guests here, we'd like to show that video first. Being a math teacher, I feel like I need to start off this program with a number. 2,500. I know some of you are immediately trying to figure out why 2,500. Well, it's kind of an estimate, but approximately the number of students that I've had the pleasure of teaching in my 23 years here at Effort. Now, before I get to the reason I bring up that number, uh, I need to let you know a little, little secret. As much as Dr. Harding likes to think you believe, us teachers don't remember all those students' names over the years. With the whole online thing and the masks, I'm really lucky if I remember students' names from last year. There is one student's name that I will never forget. The student's name was Nick. I had Nick in class his junior year. For those of you who had had me in class, I usually start off almost every class period looking around the classroom, finding the empty desks, and asking, where's so-and-so? Well, that day was no different. It was Monday, September 26, 2004, and I looked around the room, saw an empty desk, and I said, where's Nick? The class got eerily quiet, and after a few moments, someone from the back of the class finally sputtered out, I think Nick was in a car accident last night. Unfortunately, that ended up being the truth. And unfortunately, Nick's desk would remain empty from that point on. We didn't get the details right away, but that Sunday night, Nick was a passenger in a car with a driver that should have never been behind the wheel. That driver was impaired, driving too fast, and veered off the road on Ross Hill Road just about a mile up from the Wendy's. Nick and another passenger in a back seat both passed away due to the injuries they incurred from the accident. Our program this morning is designed to help you see how the decisions you make not only affect your life, but the lives of the people around you. Our first speaker this morning is Dr. Ryan Ennis. Ryan is currently the superintendent of the Mannheim Central School District. Probably more importantly though, Ryan and his brother Kurt both, both graduated from Ephrata High School in the late 1980s and the early 1990s. While I understand that that seems like a long time ago to you because it was before most of you were born, his message is a powerful one. I don't want to take anything away from that message, so can you please help me welcome Dr. Ryan X. Everybody. 
it's, it's an honor to be here. Um, it means a lot to me to be able to come, come and give back to this community that cared so much about me growing up, and uh, I'll share a little bit about that as we go on. You'll see pictures up here that, that are from an album that my mom made for me um, after I lost my brother, and I'll get into that story in a moment. Um, I got to speak on this stage in 1989 when I spoke at Baccalaureate. Uh, it's kind of exciting because it looks a lot, a, a lot the same, the same size of, of my graduating class uh, that all of you are here. Uh, and I have a lot of great memories here. I, I loved after school going up to the rec or hitting the Dairy Queen or going down to the Effort of Pool or when the Effort of Fair was in town where all of us would just go right to the fair after school. Green Dragon for uh, food on Fridays was always fun. Uh, and just all the people, every time I drive back here, to present or to come into town, uh, it makes me remember all the people that impacted my life positively. And I want you to know that you're really fortunate to be in a community that's willing to do all of this for you. Um, when I started speaking here in the early 2000s, there were still some teachers that uh, were still here that I had, but now I realize that time has passed. And I realize that there are teachers here that I went to school with, and a lot of you uh, I went to high school, or my brother went to high school with your, uh, with your parents. So Mr. White, Mr. Shortest, Mr. Hop, Mr. Mallant, Coach Shelley, I played baseball with him and so did my brother. Uh, Mr. Hagen and Mrs. Ludwig, I definitely want to give a shout out to because they gave me this list that I'm about to share. Uh, these are all the people that, that my brother and I went to high school with your, uh, with your parents. And we might have missed some, but this is a pretty long list and not in any particular order. Owen Gockley, Mason Hagen, Olivia Good, Brett Devlin, Grace Schmid, uh, Dawson Shelley, Braden Sorensen, Brooke Stover, Bree Umstead, Abel Wolf, Alyssa Brown, Taylor Hopped, Annika Galen, Ava Howard, Drew Hurst, Sawyer Jones, Dylan Cole, Dylan Jansen, Tanner McCracken, Barbara Price, Owen Luce, Audrey Risser, Laney Reinhold, Coy Schwanger, Tori Wise, Chase Wellworth, Mallory Klein, Cammie Andes, Avery McCarty, Austin Brass, Dylan Mahant, Sarah Heberly. And I also went to high school with Mr. Galen's wife. Uh, so that's a long list, which means I'm getting old. But it also means that a lot of you in this community, uh, I got to grow up with your parents, and now I get to give back, and that means a lot to me. Um, and like I said, I'm, I'm sure I've missed some. My senior year of high school, the last story I'll tell about that, uh, my dad was the JV coach. My mom was an assistant cheerleading coach, and I was on the varsity basketball team, and my brother, because he was so good, was a ninth grader on the basketball team. So my entire family, seniors, if you can imagine, I had to ride the bus to away games with my entire family. It was horrible. Uh, in, a, in a great way now, because now I think back and it was really cool, but at that time, that was really tough, uh, as you can imagine. So you're seeing pictures of our lives growing up in Ephrata. Uh, all, my whole memory of growing up is in Ephrata. I, I, we moved back to Ephrata. My parents were high school sweethearts here. Uh, they grew up here, and this place meant everything to them as well. Uh, but you're seeing pictures of Kurt. He was a really good athlete here at Ephrata. He ran track. Uh, his senior year, he decided to go out for the baseball team, and he batted over 500 and was an all-star uh, his senior year and hadn't played since eighth grade. Uh, he was really good at art. He got a lot of art awards here. And he was the review athlete of the week. Uh, I appreciate the review for all the coverage that they've given Kurt and my family over the years for sure. Um, so he had an incredible life. We had an incredible life here. He went on to Randolph-Macon bas to play basketball. He, that was his passion. He scored over 1,500 points there, had a bright future ahead. He had some opportunities to play overseas. Uh, and then he was also engaged to be married. So he had everything going for him, and uh, life is all about choices. And August 12th, 1997 is the last time we spoke, and I still remember it. It was before cell phones uh, in the 90s. They were just coming into, into play, so they weren't as readily available. He calls me. I lived in Lidditz at the time. Hey, Ryan, Julie and I, Julie's his fiance, we're going to go out in Lancaster. Do you want to join us? Um, and I said no, which I almost never said no to getting together with him and hung up the phone. And um, 
This is where this discussion gets hard because I didn't know that would be the last time I would ever talk to my brother. He was my best friend. And um, so I got a call from my dad at four in the morning. And this is, again, before cell phones, things go to voicemail. So I hear at like four in the morning his voice on my uh, phone answering machine and says, Ryan, when you get this message, please give me a call. So of course that made me sit up and um, know that something was wrong. So I called him and he said, you need to come to the house, there's been an accident. <clears throat> so I get to my parents' house in effort to right up the street here and uh, the, they tell me that he, he and Julie, uh, Julie was driving, they had been out, had a couple drinks, not her fault, he was drinking too. They get in the car and they're coming home on Oregon Pike, you guys all know, coming from Lancaster, Oregon Pike, and somehow uh, she lost control of the vehicle, hit the guardrail, and was, she was thrown from the car and run over, and uh, the car landed on top of my brother. Uh, he had his seatbelt on, but the, the, the viciousness of how the accident happened brought half of his body outside of the car when it landed on top of him. <clears throat> So the next day was a blur because, um, and I don't really remember much, but I remember like Lancaster newspaper wanted, wanted pictures because Kirk was a well-known athlete and really well-known in the Lancaster community. So they wanted pictures that reflected who, and they wanted quotes about who he was. And this was all like within hours I hadn't slept of knowing that I lost him and he was my best friend. Um, and then by noon, I had to go to Stradlings to pick out his casket. And if you can imagine, age 27, at this time in my life I had ne never had anything bad happen to me, picking out my brother's casket, um, you know, what the options are, you see a couple over here, and, and not being able to think straight. And I remember um, wanting to see him because, you know, like, I just talked to him last night. And I remember that my two uncles and um, Mr. Stradling, who many of you may know, or at least you may know as kids, um, from Stradling Funeral Home were like physically holding me back because they said, you don't want to see him. You don't want to see him um, because of how damaged he was. <clears throat> so where do you go from there? Um, and I want, one thing I want to share with all of you, no matter what choices you're making that are negative, Every time you make a negative choice, the odds increase that something bad's going to happen. Kirk didn't, he wasn't like a partier, drinker, out all the time type of guy, but he made one choice that was a terrible mistake and now he's gone. And um, the way it impacts the ripple effect that it has on everyone else's life is really hard to explain because like for myself, I had a teacher, I taught at Cacalico and I was a basketball coach there. Uh, I had a teacher across the hall from me ask me about two years after Kurt's accident if I was ever going to smile again. And because it just impacts everything about, I moved away from here, I moved to Reading to be away because I didn't want to be around anybody. Uh, fortunately, I met my wife and she pulled me out of all that, <laughs> or I don't know where I would be. But when you make a choice that's negative, it impacts all the people who love you not just your immediate family, it's your best friends, it's the people you go to school with, it's, it's everything. And I can't explain enough how every choice matters. So Kurt was inducted into the Hall of Fame here and at Randolph-Macon, and the thing that wasn't fair about that is uh, I had to accept those awards. I wasn't the one who had those accomplishments, and I have to stand there and hold the plaque and get the pictures taken. If you Google Kurt and Randolph-Macon, the Hall of Fame picture comes up and I'm standing there. That's not fair. <clears throat> Even today at Randolph-Macon, where he goes to college, they run a clinic that they just started this year called the Live Like Kirk Clinic because he was such a leader down there. He was a captain of the basketball team and won a lot of awards. And I speak to young adults all the time about this. And uh, that's all great. And you know they, they even they gave out T-shirts at the clinic this this year. Two weekends ago, I was down there, and it's an image of him. But he's not here, so none of this really matters because he's not here. And it, it it hurts to think about it all the time. <clears throat> 
to this day it hurts. Uh, I notice he's gone, like driving in here today was really hard. Uh, at holidays, anytime I go into a gym, uh, because a lot of our life was in basketball, my dad was a coach here, and I told you my mom was a cheerleading coach here. Um, but it, my mom's never been the same. When you, do, when you make a choice, and you'll hear these letters today that are gonna be really powerful, and you're gonna, uh, even though the kids are here, the parents are still gonna cry because um, it, it, it changes every, my mom has never been the same. For many, many years, till about three years ago, she was taking sleeping pills from 1997 till then, just so she could sleep at night. Um, and the way she was when I was a kid, when I was your age, is gone. And my dad is, has passed from cancer, but he was never the same either. And all the blessings in our lives have been missed. I, I know that I, when I was introduced, you know, I get to be the, the superintendent at Mannheim Central. I coach basketball. I worked in other school districts. I have kids that you're seeing up here. Um, Kurt's never seen any of that. He's never met, he's never seen any of it. Some of you I know have competed against my, my kids in basketball and lacrosse. Um, he's never seen that, and he would have loved it. He would have been an amazing uncle, and that really bothers me that he's not here to see them, <clears throat> and he hasn't been a, a part of the journey. And it's, it's, I'm still recovering, and again, like I said, I'm, I'm really fortunate to have met Jen. So this message is about choices. If you're taking these chances, or others, you're disregarding this, and you aren't considering uh, what your family's going to go through. So just think about that, the times that, you know, someone offers you pills, or someone offers you, like, vapes are the big thing now, or someone offers you a drink. Um, think about the choices that you're making, not right there, but think about what, how it impacts everybody else. Think about this community that's put this on to prevent you from doing those things. Some of you are out there saying it won't happen to you. I guarantee Kurt wasn't thinking about what could happen when he got in that car. Uh, because he didn't take a lot of those chances, but it was that one chance that cost him. And I'm sure he would take it all back if he would see what he's been missing. And some of you have parents that say, oh, you guys can drink in our basement. We'll take the keys. Well, they're forgetting. Those parents are forgetting that in a couple years when you're out on your own, no one's taking those keys. No one took Julie's keys. Kirk didn't even take Julie's keys. So remember that if you have those parents that think that's cool, that's garbage. And no one's perfect. I don't want, I'm not up here because I want anyone to feel sorry for me. I made bad decisions. All the adults in this room have made bad decisions and made poor choices. But every time, again, you take a, make a poor choice, you increase the odds of another poor choice happening and something bad happening to you. So my question to you is, what will you do to help a friend who's making bad choices? That's the next step. You know, why didn't someone take the keys from Julie and tell Kurt and Julie not to go anywhere? He was with a huge group of friends. I could have been there, and I, did, I chose not to go. And that still haunts me to this day. But what are you going to do for a friend who's making bad choices? And the final thought I'm going to leave with you today <clears throat> is that all of you have seen my family, at least in a picture or in person. Kurt has not. And think of that before you do anything. And maybe your family won't have to live with this pain. Because it doesn't go away. Like, I have an amazing life. I, like I said, I get to be a superintendent. I have amazing children and a great wife, but it's still there. It's still right here and in the back of my head all the time. <clears throat> and if one of, life, one of life is saved today from this message, I know that Kurt would think it's worth it. So I want to thank you, and I want to thank the community for putting this on and the courage that the kids have that went through all this the last couple days. And uh, I just want to say thank you and it's all about choices and make sure you make the right choices. Thank you. We have another round of applause for Dr. Axe for taking this.
Every 15 Minutes program is a nationally recognized program based on the old statistic that every 15 minutes someone is killed in a drunk or distracted driving accident. Last evening, while completely isolated from the outside world, we challenged a group of your classmates behind me to examine their decisions, the decisions they make, and how their decisions can affect everyone in their lives. These students were challenged to write a letter that begins, every 15 minutes someone is killed in a drunk or distracted driving accident. Today I died and never got the chance to tell you. We also asked that their family members write letters to them with the same theme. A few of these students and their family members have agreed to share these letters with you. First up will be Grayson Schmidt. Dear Mom and Dad, Olivia and Caroline, every 15 minutes someone dies from a drunk or distracted driving accident. Today I died and never got to tell you that I loved you one last time. There's not really words to say that express my gratitude. There's no possible way, there's no possible way to describe our love for each other. It's messy and it's complicated, and, but it's always there and it's always consistent. Mom and Dad, I know you both love me in a way that I can only hope and pray to love my children as. And I know that I love you, and you know that I love you back, whether I say it back or just respond with a yeah, I know. It makes me love you so much more because you never get tired of saying it. Mom, I know this is something that breaks you. Every single time I walk out the garage door, I'm met with a please slow down, drive safe, or be careful. And I usually respond with a yeah, I know, again, or a bye, I love you. I'm sorry that I didn't take it seriously. And I'm really, really sorry, Mom. I'm sorry that I never want help from you. And I'm sorry that I say no to your offers to dry my hair, go get coffee, and the normal daughter, mother-daughter things that you do with Olivia. I'm sorry when I choose my friends over family dinner. And I love you for saying it's fine, we can do it tomorrow, just go. Even though I know you need the time together just as much as my friends do, I'm sorry for keeping you awake all night while I'm working or with friends, even though I know that you'll be awake until everyone's under one roof. But thank you for supporting my every move, whether you understand it or not. Thank you for the way you love me, even when even from opposite personalities. I know I get my toughness from you, since I see you cry maybe once a year. <laughs> You're the strongest woman I know, and you don't let people walk all over you, which is something that I can only hope to have for myself. I love the way you encourage me to be a woman in leadership, in whatever way that is, and I'm sorry that I'm not the emotional child in the family. And I'm sorry that I don't come running when I know I should. But I know that you'll have open arms each and every time, no matter the age or the circumstance. And I hope you know that I love you just the same, even if I don't express it outwardly. Dad, I can't, I can't find the words for you either. I love you for all that you are. And as someone who's been so close since I was little, we're like the same person. We like the same foods. We dress the same, we talk the same, and you get my humor, which is the craziest part. <laughs> you just get it every time. And uh, I don't have words for the way you cheer me on. Yeah, you know, I don't have words for the way that you cheer me on because it's not always with words. I just know you'll support me, especially in sports and in college. And you and mom don't have to say a single word and I know that you'll love me just the same. Thank you for loving me so well. Olivia, thank you for never giving up. You never give up on trying to find similarities between the two of us, even though we're polar opposites and rarely get along on the same day. I would love you and want to hear about your life from the farthest away, I promise. And Caroline, I love you for all the joy that you find in the small things. You're just about the only person who would be ecstatic to rip stick on the road or in the basement with me. And thank you for sharing those core memories with me that I'll never forget. 
and to the four of you, I love you to even greater measures than you can comprehend. Every 15 minutes, someone in the United States is either killed or seriously injured in an impaired or distracted driving-related collision. Today, I found out that you died, and I never had the chance to tell you how much I love you. We were born fundamentally different people, and as we continue to get older, it has only proved more and more true. I grew up pursuing music, buried in my academics, obsessing over boys and fashion, while you grew up on the field hockey team, taking part in various Bible studies and youth groups, and deadlifting triple my weight. I've always been the more sentimental, emotional, and dramatic one of the two of us, while you were always good at pretending things didn't bother you even when they did. We never talked that much while I've been away at college, mostly leaving or catching up for when I surprise you in the doorframe of your bedroom, anticipating your snarky, why are you home this time, comment, before I make you hug me. It was always comforting knowing that even though we didn't talk every day or even every week, I could count on you simply because you were still here. I should have reached out to you. The last text conversation we ever had was when you texted me on Easter to tell me how excited you were to meet my college best friend, Mickey. You told me that you were glad I invited her to our family dinner and you welcomed her into our home. When we walked in, you were attempting to play the guitar for some reason, but stopped to stand up and give Mickey a hug. And for those who knew Grayson, you all know her hugs were far too rare. Another recent conversation we had was when I told you that you're like the modern day Gandhi, except that you hopefully wouldn't end up in jail, which was my failed poor attempt to call you wise. You replied with a simple LOL, which is typical Grayson Schmidt shortness, but I regret not telling you more about how I always thought you were a good person. You were the most humble and the most selfless person I've ever known. You are such a good person, and people like you are too far, few, and in between. It seems like just yesterday we were running around the old house singing Where We Belong by Thriving Ivory, a song that our mom put us on at the time. We didn't know what any of it meant, just that it was a fun song to dance to and sing while sandwiched between pillows on the couch. We made videos on photo booth, and I somehow always ended up chasing you around the kitchen with dad's shoes. Where we belong is here together. You deserve to be here. You deserve to graduate. You deserve to go to college. You deserve to make it to all the hiking spots you never used to shut up about. You deserve to go to Colorado and Montana to see mountains bigger than the effort of mountain even though I always made fun of you for wanting to go there instead of L.A. Perhaps one of the only things we've ever truly had in common has been the way we love Caroline, the baby of our family. I promise to continue to love her and to do my best to protect her as you did, not only because she is our sister, but because she is the person that reminds me most of you. When I look at her, I see the bits and pieces of you that you left behind. I see your gentleness. I see your innocence and your good, pure heart. I see your athleticism and I see your drive. I have so much to learn from her and I have even more to learn from you. I miss you and I love you. I miss laughing with you and I miss your smile. I miss sneaking notes into your old plastic toy mailbox outside our bedrooms at the old house. I miss hearing you talk about how I pushed you out that second story window while we played drive through I miss hearing you cry over literally every little thing under the sun. I miss you coming to my choir concerts. And I miss you talking about your achievements as if they're not a big deal, even though I always tried to convince you that it was okay to be proud of them. There's an awful lot missing. 
Heaven is simply too far away from here. Grayson, please give the big man upstairs a big hug for me because he's blessed me in a way you will never know. Being your older sister has been the ultimate reward. Its benefits I will reap for all of time. And to the big man upstairs, I know we're not on great terms right now, but please take care of my sister. She deserves the whole world, and yet she's no longer in it. Please give her the extra love she can't feel with us here and her there. Please tell her how much she's loved every single day, as I often neglected to do so myself. And tell her that I can't wait to see her again, even if I will have to wait a very long time. Grayson, there are no words to describe the grief your mother, sisters, and I are feeling. Your brilliant, shining light of a life cut short has left me feeling numb and desperate. Okay, there, I'm done. Uh, no more words of hopelessness and despair. You've heard enough from the rest of my family. While your body is no longer here, your spirit lives on and will inspire me every day, just as you did when you were alive. I will hear you on the wind when I go hiking on our favorite trail. I will see your beautiful smile when the daffodils are blooming. I will feel your warm hug when I drink my coffee out of the dad mug you gave me for Father's Day. Do I have any regrets? Well, I'm sure there's some minor things. Um, but I don't regret hugging you every day. And I don't regret saying, I love you every day. This is not goodbye. It's just until we meet again. I love you, Grace. Just 
tell you how much I love your funny sarcasm or when you vlog on your Instagram story and when we sit in the kitchen talking hours after we finished eating. I'll miss the lectures you and Allie give me even if I act like I hate it. I'll miss the way you push me to be stronger in everything I do. I appreciate when you hug me when I'm crying or sit and talk when I'm upset. I appreciate you going out of your way to help me with school or schoolwork and college decisions. I appreciate the way you taught me how to grow up with all the morals and lessons. The way you encouraged me to be such a good-hearted person who treats everyone with respect and kindness. I regret not telling you how. I regret not telling you I love you more. I regret asking you, not asking you how your day was after you asked me about mine. I regret not spending more time with you, Allie and Sawyer. I most definitely regret not listening to you sooner. You have changed my life around so much and have cared for me the most a dad can. Even with all of our fights over the past few years, it doesn't, it doesn't matter because in the end I love you so much and I would never change anything that has happened. You have helped me in every which way, and there are no words to describe how much I appreciate it, even if it seems like I don't care. I'll miss all the laughs, all the cries, all the joy, and all of the memories. You've made me so strong and have made me feel a confidence I never knew I had in me. I've never realized over the past few months that everything you have said or done was to help me succeed and to make me happy. I owe you... I owe you an apology for taking some of the things you said for granted. You have done the most a father can, so once again, I love you and I'll miss you, and I'm sorry. Today is the worst day of my life. He died in an accident. I'm not sure my broken heart will ever heal. As I stand here today, I just want to tell you all the things I didn't get a chance to. Because we always think there's tomorrow. I'm incredibly proud to be your father. And I hope you know you're my most favorite daughter ever. You always put a smile on my face, and I love your goofy personality, especially when you say one of your camera-isms. It always makes me laugh. They're the best. I love coming to cheer for you at whatever sport you're playing at the time. Rugby is, uh, was definitely made for you, though. You are always such a tough cookie, even when you were little. I'm sad. Sad that I'll never see you wear the dress that's hanging in the closet to prom. Or watch you throw your cap at graduation. I wonder if he would have went, went to college uh, one day, moved to the beach like he wanted. The best years of your life were right around the corner. 
Family vacations will not be the same without you. The holidays will officially suck, especially Christmas Eve, considering that's the day you were born. I'm sad, I'll never see how pretty you'd look. wedding dress or walk down the aisle. I'm sad I'll never watch you become a mother. Or maybe not. Maybe you would have lived a life. Thank you. Uh, full of cool experiences instead. I'm just glad I'm just sad I won't see the future that was waiting for you. I'm sorry if I didn't do enough for you. Or if you thought I was too hard on you about your grades and making good choices. It's only because I loved you and I wanted your life to be easier than mine. I'm also sorry I didn't talk to you more about the consequences there can be when driving while distracted. Tragedies like this one really make you think about the things left unsaid that may have made a difference. I should have told you about my own experience when I was the same age as you, when I was a junior. February 98, I could Calica High School where I graduated when four of my friends, Ponnet, now James and Boogie, were also in a horrific car accident on the road right behind our high school. They weren't drinking or driving or anything like that. They were speeding, probably goofing around. Boogie lost control of the car. The car collided with a telephone pole and it split in half. None of them survived. All four died immediately on impact. It was terrible. I guess that was also one of the worst days of my life. And here I am reliving the same nightmare. Cammy, I'm going to miss seeing your beautiful face every day and hearing your voice. I'll miss telling you to hurry up and get out of the bathroom that you take forever to stop using all the water. I'm going to miss all the little things that I don't even realize yet. I know I'll see you again one day in heaven. Tell the good Lord who said what's up and to take care of you until I get there. I love you so much. down here and the students behind me. I didn't preface the program with this, but they've been without their cell phones for 24 hours, so they've had no contact with the outside world. That being said, our final presenter of this morning's program is a man you might be familiar with. He is the former executive director of TNC Youth Ministries and worked with Ephrata School District for over 20 years. He is currently a marriage and family therapist with Thrive Counseling Services. Please help me welcome Dr. Mike Winger. Let me correct that. I am not a doctor. Well, how do you follow that? Very, very emotional, um, but it preferences a lot of what I want to share with you this morning. Um, the last two days um, are not just to shock you or warn you about the dangers of uh, driving under the influence or distracted driving. Um, they're about how your choices not just affect you, but those around you. Uh, this morning, I want to wrap up uh, the assembly by not talking about death, but talking about life. Life is so fragile, we really do not know how much time we have. Um, whether you believe it or not, your life is precious, extremely precious. Think about you individually, um, 
you sneeze different than everybody else. Everybody sneezes differently, if you notice that. Some people hold it in, some people let it out. Um, but even laughing, some people laugh and you know who's laughing. Um, there was a time when I was at a restaurant, I had taken a, a young person out to lunch and we were sitting in, uh, it was Ephrata Diner at that time, but now it's Gus's. We're sitting there and I he we hear this, this laugh, this cackling laugh. And we started laughing because it was so loud and it was so just out there, right? And we start laughing and then all of a sudden, it, we start laughing at the person laughing and all of a sudden it hits me, wait a second. And I stood up and looked over the barrier and it was my mom. <laughs> I was just like, oh my gosh, mom. Anyway, so, uh, you guys are all extremely special and amazing. Um, and so I want you to not take life for granted. Uh, you have maybe, maybe you've been told differently in your life. Maybe somebody very special to you has, um, in a moment of anger, moment, a moment of weakness, has told you that they don't care about you, that you're a failure, that you won't amount to anything. I want you to know that that's a lie. And it's garbage. Because I believe that you can do anything that you put your mind to. When I look out over this audience, I see incredible potential to change the world. And can I be honest with you? I don't know if you can see it in our world. Does our world need changing? Yes. Extremely yes. We need change. And I believe, I believe you. And I believe you have the power to make that change happen. Change for the good. I believe um, that you can make good choices. Choices that will give you life instead of stealing your life. Choices that will give, make your heart full instead of make your heart ache. Because life is a blessing. And it's been a blessing for me over the last 20 plus years that I've been able to come in and, and be here. Now this year I haven't been able to as much because I'm in a different position in life. But even being here, um, seeing your faces and being around, it's just such a blessing. And just to see all of you. You guys need to take these last two days and not just let it be another assembly, another activity that happened. You need to take these days and you need to wake up. You need to wake up and realize how precious life is. Because when you boil life down to its basic, uh, the best of life, it's about relationships, period. That's what life's about, relationships. It's not about this. It's not about this. We care today more about plastic than we do about people. We care more about screens. How often do we get a text and we look down and we quick read it and then quick look back up and in that instant we could be in a car accident or cause an accident for somebody else. Happens all the time, every day. And so ultimately what are we saying? We're saying that this screen is more important than ourselves and the people around us or even the people in our car. We're so distracted. How many times are you talking to somebody? And they're saying something really important to you, and you feel the buzz. And so you look down and look in the midst of their sentence. What's the message that's being sent? Has that happened to you? And i got to be honest, I'm not just saying this to you. I'm saying this to me, too, because I do it, too. And it's awful. It's awful. We're too, you know, this is supposed to connect us. However, I think it's causing more disconnection. I want you today to really focus on spending more time with the people that you love. To tell them that you love them. You know, my dad just died this past July. And it's still so hard for me because I would just love to see his face and to go and walk with him again and to tell him I love him. And you know, many Saturdays um, we talk about getting together and going for a walk, but. I'd always have something I had to do. And now I can't do it. 
And so I wish I could just hug him one more time and tell him I love him one more time because he was an amazing dad. So I want to encourage you to not wait. I also want to encourage you, uh, you're getting to the end of your school year, to forgive others and let it go. We hold on to too much petty crap. We really do. You may be sitting in a room today where you were best friends with somebody and you're no longer best friends because of stupid stuff. Let it go. Learn to forgive. It's Life is too short to hold on to this stuff and not have a great relationship. We live in a society that has become a lot about me. Not me, me, but me. Like selfishness. And uh, we believe if we can get all the pleasures that we want, if we can get all the money, success, and fame that we want, that we'll be happy. That we'll be satisfied. But I can honestly tell you the best thing that I've seen as a marriage and family therapist is when I see couples, when I see families, when I see individuals engaging in healthy relationships. That's when it clicks for them. And they're like, yes, this is what life's about. It's not about how many followers I have. It's not how many likes I have. It's not how, many, um, how much money I have or how many people think I'm, I'm good looking. I mean, especially for me doesn't work for me anymore, but, or ever, but it's not about that. It's about relationships and really being uh, with somebody. Life is more than just partying. It's, help, help, it's, it's about helping to make the future better, caring about other, others, and finding a love worth fighting for. You know, many people think I'm weird. No, seriously, they, they think I'm pretty screwed up, messed up, whacked out. And I kind of am. Um, in fact, when I worked for TNT, there was many people that, um, it was funny, um, there was many people that would write or they would tell, they, they thought I was a cult leader. <laughs> right? Because he must have some hidden agenda. Like, what is with him? He's always smiling and he's always talking to kids. <laughs> Does he have a van? Right. <laughs> and I'd hand out donuts and cookies and candy, right? Yeah, I don't know, boy. And so, when I would boil it down and ask them, like, what, what was behind it? They're like, well, you smile all the time. Oh my gosh, that's awful, right? And how sad we become, um, Come that, that, that a person who actually cares about people and wants to brighten someone day is considered weird. Well, if that's weird, here I am. Right? Because I enjoy brightening, brightening someone else's day. I love being kind. I like making people laugh. I love just getting into somebody else's world and hearing what's going on with them. Um, it's funny because um, it, whether it was graduate school or my work now, they call me the golden retriever. And if I would have a tail, it would always be because I just, if you see a golden retriever, they're just happy to be you, you know, to be around you. They're just excited to see you, right? And that's how I, that's why I am. I love life. I, I love life. I love it. I love being married to the hottest woman on the planet for 29 years. I mean, seriously. She's got it going on, right? I, I love her. I love that I have two awesome, amazing children. And one just got married in August, this past August. And you know what's interesting? You know, my wife and I, we lost a child um, uh, about 23 years ago. His name was Joshua. Get this. My daughter married a man named Joshua who's 23 years old. Isn't that awesome? Just amazing. Um, and so I don't need drugs. I don't, because I, I'm high all the time. <laughs> I'm high on life. I love it. I eat it up. I love it. I just love it. I, I love it. I just love it, right? You know? And so I really try to stay positive, right? This last couple years with COVID has been very, very difficult. My father died of um, some, some complications, some health issues, plus COVID. 
And so it's been a really hard couple years and, you know, masks, not masks, vaccines, vaccines, just ugh, and it separated us. And no longer can we have conversations, we're having debates, and we're having, I hate you. What, your favorite color's green? I hate you, because mine's red, and we cannot be friends anymore, it's stupid. Like, we gotta start having conversations again, and having relationships again. I wanna encourage you to be that generation. Change our culture, change this town. Stand strong in knowing that you are loved and in love and in turn love others. Be about relationships and helping others and I guarantee you that you will have a great life. You will, you will enjoy life. Now, I'm gonna do something a little, I hope you don't find it too stupid, but I'm gonna try something here. I'm gonna give you the Rocky speech from Rocky Balboa. I'm gonna try, who, like, who saw Rocky Balboa? Yeah, right? If you didn't, watch it. If you don't like boxing, don't watch it. Okay. So I'm going to try it here. I'm not going to talk like him because it will just come off late. So I'm just going to do it. I'm going to do it the best I can. Okay, so you know when you were little, I used to hold you right here. I'd hold you up. And I'd say to your mother, this kid's going to be the best kid in the world. This kid's going to be somebody better than anybody I ever knew. And you grew up good and wonderful. It was great just watching you. Every day was like a privilege. Then the time came for you to be on your own man and take on the world. And you did. But somewhere along the line, you changed. You stopped being you. You let people stick a finger in your face and tell you you're no good. And when things got hard, you started looking around for someone or something to blame, like a big shadow. Let me tell you something you already know. The world ain't all sunshine, sunshine and rainbows. It's a very mean and nasty place, and I don't care how tough you are, it will beat you to your knees and keep you permanently if, there if you let it. You, me, or nobody gonna hit as hard as life, but it ain't about how hard you hit, it's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. Now if you know what you're worth, they go out and get it. But you gotta be willing to take the hits and not pointing fingers saying you ain't where you wanna be because of him or her or anybody. Cowards do that and that ain't you. You're better than that. Today, you're awesome, you're amazing, you got potential, you can do whatever you wanna do. You can make great choices, you can have great relationships and I wanna encourage you to live to laugh, and to love. Thank you. accident when he was in his early 20s. Uh, he and my mom had been married for a year. 
he got into a car with his brother. His brother was drunk. Back then, you know, seatbelts weren't really the same thing. Smashed his head in, spent weeks in a coma, almost died. And my mom, you know, I only knew my dad as, you know, the, old, the older guy, um, the older version of him. But he said that he was a completely and utterly different person after the head trauma. He had trauma induced epilepsy, all kinds of other health issues related to that. She's like, that's not the guy I married. He was a completely different person because of drinking and driving. Um, we've had other people that are impacted text messaging. I know, know of a guy, I don't know this person, but he, he was turning his life around. He had some addiction issues. Uh, was dealing with uh, kind of a halfway house in Lidditz, and he turned his life around. Starting a business, doing really, really well. Heard the stories of how much he, you know, he, he'd done. Took a text message, ran a red light, killed somebody. Turned his life around. Again, after he'd been through tough times, he made a bad decision by looking at a message. Ran a, ran a stop sign and killed somebody. It takes seconds. It's so easy to happen. And we, and it's, again, no one ever thinks it's gonna to happen to them. Um, you know, life is incredibly fragile. It really is. Uh, don't take that for granted. And if there's nothing else you take from today, you know, one life saved is worth every minute. And these, these guys have spent hours working on this. If there's nothing else, don't forget to say to the people you, you love that you love them, give them a hug. <coughs> Whatever that means to you, whoever that is, whether it's the person sitting next to you or your friend or your parents, don't take them for granted. Yeah, we're all screw-ups. Your parents are screw-ups too. I'm a screw-up. Well. That's her. Okay? We all make mistakes. Um, but life is incredibly fragile and care for them, care for others. Uh, absolutely. Please. Please take care of others. Because um, you only get one shot with that. And life, life is definitely too short. And it can be very cliche. Um, and hopefully, I, I've unfortunately had to announce uh, students at graduation have died. Some unfortunately to suicide. Some to car accidents. Just in my nine years here, there's three, uh, th at least three individuals who had to deal with that, the, the loss. I was in a classroom in the early 2000s, and I had a student who was driving, and his friend, they weren't drunk driving, his ice killed his friend. There was an empty seat in my classroom. So we, it, it's all too common, but don't take each other for granted. Yes, where there are two people, there will be friction, and there will be conflict, and there will be disagreement, because we're human. But we need to be able to get over those things and move beyond, and forgiveness is maybe the most powerful force in the world, um, and have a lot of grace for each other. So I know some of you have been deeply impacted by this. I can hear a few of you around me uh, see some of that. If you need some, someone to talk to, our counselors are available down in the counseling office. Uh, please take advantage of that. Sometimes you just need to get it out and have to process those emotions because uh, it is a very emotional thing. Some of you are more stoic. Some of you wear your emotions on your sleeve. It's obvious for others. But if you need to talk, the counselors are there for you. Um, teachers, uh, I'm going to give you a moment to head back to head, room, head back to home first. Oops, sorry. I just got a message. We do have somebody else in the audience that actually wants to come up and say a few words. Said we wouldn't walk down the aisle. 
I, I told her that we would go in like, like the Titans. You ever saw the movie Remember the Titans? We would walk down the aisle. <laughs> The day of her wedding, we got halfway down the aisle. They stopped the traditional music and we walked the rest of the way like Titans. There are other things that you get to experience in life if you make decent decisions. You get to jump out of an airplane and have to be so scared that you would never do it again. But you would probably do it again. Other things in life for the older people. Maybe you get to experience standing on the corner of Winslow, Arizona. You have to be that old to understand the eagle soul. All right? But going through this, making good decisions, definitely has its benefits. All right? Maybe, you know, that wasn't shown today. But being part of this, making good decisions is such a benefit in life. You get to experience life. And when you get to be 62 years old, you turn around, you think, wow, kind of glad I did that. I'm kind of glad I got to experience those things in life. Make good decisions. You'll be happy you did. Good amounts. <laughs>